darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I am your host, Abraham Hamilton III, joined by producer extraordinaire, often imitated, never duplicated, also known to start mess in the studio, <laughs> troubling young folks and things of that nature. <laughs> Talking about the real J. Mack, ladies and gentlemen, and we are ready to rock and roll with today, today's edition of the program. It's something that has been on my heart quite a bit, and I just want to present it to you today uh, because there are many, unfortunately, uh, who are allowing um, our context, particularly if you are an American citizen, uh, to manipulate us away from an aspect of faithfulness that God calls us to, frankly and kind of duping us into refusing to use everything at our disposal uh, to be ambassadors of our king, to set the tone uh, for executing the Great Commission uh, in, our, in, our, in our nation. You know, the Lord is at work all over the world. I, I rejoice to learn about the, the saints that literally are staring death in the face, but who will declare, for Christ I live and for Christ I'll die. You know, in nations like Iran, where... Uh, it's being reported that the largest numbers of uh, n conversions are taking place. It's amazing uh, what's happening in China. It's amazing what's happening in Nigeria and in Sudan. And, you know, the gospel is exploding uh, in Puerto Rico. You know, uh, we, my wife and I stay plugged into what's going on in the Spanish-speaking parts of the world. Um, it's, it's amazing what God is doing all over, the world, all over the world. But the Lord is also at, at work here in America. I want to talk about that uh, a little bit and to just uh, remind us of our assignment. At this very moment, many of you, if not most of you, are making your transition from your part-time jobs where you generate an income to your full-time jobs. And that is cultivating an outcome. As you do so, I want to remind you to do it with intentionality, understanding the primacy that God places on family, welcoming his view to guide us and to instruct us in terms of what our view should be, and then welcoming his view to direct our engagement. It's we will never, ever, ever be able to out-politic or even out-church deficiencies in the home. By God's grace, let us turn our homes uh, into sanctuaries for his presence, and it we come in, in that our homes become uh, discipleship station number one starting in our own homes and working outward from there. That is what we have the opportunity to do. And there are lots of things that we can do, but this one thing Jesus instructed us to do, to go into all the world, making disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded us. With that, let us turn to the word of God. Matthew chapter 5 is where we're going to go today. Matthew chapter 5, we'll have some additional cross-references throughout the show. Uh, but Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 13 through 16 is where we're going to begin the program. This is uh, the longest recorded sermon of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. There's an aspect there, and this, these are the, the verses where we get the description of the believer's salt and light duty. All right. This is what the Word of God says. You, <clears throat> excuse me, are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works 
and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The conclusion of verse 16 there is the objective. The result of our fulfillment of salt and light duty is that our Father, our Heavenly Father, is glorified. Let me take a few steps back. Straight away in verses 13 and 14, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. I've explained this before, but you there in both verses is plural. All right. It's plural. It's a reference to the people who are immediately present when Jesus is delivering the Sermon on the Mount. But it also applies to the disciples who would come to know Jesus Christ. That salt and light obligation is a pluralized Christ follower obligation. Every believer has the responsibility of being salt and light. Many of you know this. Uh, what I'm about to say next, first and foremost, salt is a preservative agent. You know, before the wonders of refrigeration, the innovation that allows things like first and foremost, uh, central air condition, air conditioning and, and refrigeration where we can store our food thing, foods and things of that nature. In Jesus's day, salt was employed in, for se in several ways, but one of the ways it was employed was as a preservative agent. All right. It was used to preserve the integrity of various, various, various proteins. I'm going to cross-reference the scripture in a moment about that. In addition to being a preservative agent, it also functioned in a way similar to, way, to the way salt is used today uh, as a seasoning agent for various, various food. Uh, light, in verse 14, and y'all have heard me say this, light is a force of power. It is an affirmative force. You've heard me explain. Darkness is not an affirmative force. Darkness merely reoccupies the space that is vacated by the light. All right. This is something we know intuitively. I've, I've stated this before uh, because none of us goes home at the end of a long work day and say, hey, honey, would, would you turn the darkness off? No, we don't do that because we know intuitively that light is affirmative. Darkness is not affirmative. Darkness merely is a reoccupant. Now, the thing about darkness is that it has a robust marketing department. <laughs> it has the capacity uh, to advertise itself, to present itself at it, as if it is ubiquitous. As if, and because of its ubiquity, meaning that it, it can appear to be everywhere, uh, all at once even in some instances, because of its ubiquity, we can often misinterpret that appearance as being synonymous with being an affirmative force. But it simply is not. It is not an affirmative force. Jesus explained in the sermons that if salt has lost its savor, if salt has lost its, its, its saltiness, what's, what is it good for? It's good for nothing. In order for salt to have efficacy, its saltiness must persist. And I have lamented on this program time and time again uh, that when the believer refuses to embrace the transformation, as Paul articulates in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, instead conforms to the world. We move away from being salt and light to being lightly salted. You know, we become a worldly Christian, as if that is okay, because it's not. Concerning the light, Jesus goes on to explain the purpose of the light and what it's supposed to accomplish. You are the light of the world. Jesus immediately turns to a metaphor, a city that is set on the hill. And Jesus says it plainly, a city that is set on the hill cannot be hidden. Doesn't, doesn't say it, it, it tries to hide. No, it cannot be hidden because of its posture on the hill. And then he explains, return it to the light. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. When Jesus refers to a lamp, he's referring to what was often employed in the first century, where you would have a, 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 a candle of some sort combined with oil of some sort. And explaining his awareness of the first century home, that if you have light, most likely produced by the fire that you have ignited and are attempting to preserve and extend, if you have it, you would not be content 
with having a self-centered or self-exclusive exposure to this light. You wouldn't put it under a basket for merely personal consumption, personal illumination, and personal warmth. Jesus, continuing this metaphor, said, no, but you would put the light on a lampstand. Again, understanding the first century home, first century Jewish home, that the utilization of the light, placing it on on the lampstand, it becomes maximally, maximally beneficial, not only for the one who ignited it or who had it personally, but it becomes maximally beneficial to all in the house. This, this phenomenon I understand very, very well. One of the things I learned uh, since joining AFR and dealing with radio and radio towers, uh, I learned a little bit about this elevation principle. Many of you may remember the, the old school Verizon commercials. Can you hear me now? Good. You know? And then you had other, you know, cell phone companies trying to say, hey, you should consider working with us. And what was their advertisement line? We have our cell phone communication equipment, our cell communication equipment on all the same towers where Verizon has theirs. What is being communicated? Hey, if you think Verizon service is good, you should consider our service. Why? Because we're on all the exact same towers. And that advertising messaging it's a wee, a wee little bit deceptive. Deceptive, love. It's a wee little bit deceptive. Why is it deceptive? Because when they tell you they have their cell communication equipment on the same towers as, as Verizon, they're really not telling you anything. Because anybody who deals with cell towers and radio towers, what, what they will communicate to you is that the benefit of being on a cell, on a cell tower has nothing to do with simply being on the tower. The question you want answered is that what is your elevation on the tower? There's a whole industry called the tower business, the tower industry, to where tower owners rent space on their tower. You want to guess which space on the tower is the most expensive? Huh? You want to guess? You want to guess, Jeff? The, the space on the towers that's the most expensive are the highest spots on the tower. Why? Because the higher you are on the tower, the less likely it will be for your communication signals to be intercepted. The lower you are on the tower, the more likely you are to suffer all manner of interference. Hence, Verizon's initial advertising. Can you hear me now? Good. Saying that we, we can be anywhere on the, on the world, in the planet, and you're going to get our communication. Why? Because we got our communication signals at the top of these towers. This is the principle that Jesus was explaining. It's not enough. It's not sufficient for you alone to have the light. Praise God that you have the light. Praise God that you have the lamp. Praise God that you have illumination. Praise God that you have warmth. But the Christ follower's task is to not just have the light, have the illumination and have the warmth, but to put it on a lampstand, to put it at the highest elevation possible so that it could be a benefit to the largest number of people possible. That is what Jesus is attempting to communicate. These, this dual function, salt and light, functioning, you know, as a preservative agent. We, who are believers in the 21st century, we have inherited a gospel that has been passed on to us intact by the grace of God. What a miracle it is. And it is the Lord's desire for us to preserve the integrity of the gospel, that we refuse to allow compromises of the gospel. We are to earnestly contend for the faith that was once and for all passed down to us, the saints. That's a part of our preservative capacity. That just as the Orthodox Christian faith, the authentic biblical gospel has made its way to us, we have a duty to preserve that. But that's one part of the salt and light mission. We also have the light responsibility, the affirmative, advancing, invading component to where we let our light so shine among men so that they glorify our Father in heaven, so that the gospel is proclaimed to the entire scope of this world. That is a part of the light function. The disciple making is a part of the light function, salt and light. That is the what of the Christ following duty. When we come back, we're going to talk about the why, the where, and the when.
Little did you know that the same legal terminology, the same legal terms that we use today, uh, probable cause, just cause, there's multiple ways to describe it, but David uses that same terminology. How do we know what's just? Well, we know what's just by looking at God's Word. That's where we get our ultimate definition of justice from. AFA at the Core with Walker Wildman. Weekday afternoons at 1 Central on American Family Radio. Sometimes shortcuts are not wise. If that's true physically, how true that might be spiritually. I think all of us have shortcut stories, you know? (laughs) But there are some you don't want a shortcut when it comes to getting to God, do you? There is no shortcut to God. It's only through Jesus. Exploring Missions with Bert and Nathan Harper, Saturday afternoons at 2.30 Central and Sundays at 1 Central on American Family Radio. Let's think about what God has done. I would wager that his top news story is still that the free salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ is available to all. I wager that will be the top news story until that salvation is no longer available. You will have made your decision for eternity. He doesn't ask us to do anything he won't. And then he does above what we can possibly do. Hear Todd Herman on A Disciple's View, weekdays 12 p.m. Central on AFR. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. Abraham Hamilton III here. We're talking salt and light duty. That is the what, if you will, of Christ following. Now we're going to get into the the why, the when, and the where. And simply put, the scripture already gives it to us. We don't even, we don't have to uh, question uh, these things because the Lord has already given us answers to them in scripture. So we talked about being salt and light. Why then are we to do this? Verse, Verse 16, why then are we to do this? Verse 16 has already told us. That our objective, the investment that we ap- ap- apply, and let me take a few steps back. When, when we're talking about the salt duty, preserving the integrity of the gospel, right? You know, refusing to allow heresies to persist. You know, thank God for, for, for brothers like Athanasius and others in the, in the past who've, who fought against uh, heretical presentations like Arianism and in, in all the others. In our day, you have modern heresies presented like so, so-called gay Christianity. A lie. No such thing as gay Christianity. No more than there's something called murderous Christianity, lying Christianity, thieving Christianity, adulterous Christianity. You know, it's absurd. It, fr- frankly, it's absurd that one would attempt to define being a follower of the way by a particular sin proclivity. It's heretical. And it's blasphemous, frankly. That's an aspect of contending for the faith that's been once and for all passed down to the saints. The Apostle Paul explained by the Spirit of God that the Lord ordained his church to be the pillar and ground of the truth. Of course, not in and of ourselves. Jesus is the cornerstone of his church. But Paul is using his awareness of Greco-Roman architecture in communicating that notion. Being the ground of the truth refers to the foundation of a building like the Greco-Roman architecture. The pillars would be the columns, the pillars that would sustain the structure, the the undergirding sustaining mechanism. The Lord ordained his church to to be the protector and purveyor of his truth. That's a part, again, of the salt and light duty, maintaining the integrity of authentic Christ following an authentic Christian witness and proclaiming, propounding that reality. Why? What is the ultimate objective? Verse 16 already says it. So that others will see what you are about and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This all, the salt and light duty, is all about glorifying our Lord and King to the maximum. Our objective, when we're contending for the faith that has been once and for all passed down to the saints, when we're proclaiming his gospel, living his gospel, it's in the forefront of our minds at all times is the glory of our Lord. That's the why, so that the Lord will be glorified. It's not for the purpose of merely being argumentative for being the sake of being argumentative or just being opposite, opposite for the sake of being opposite. No, the Lord is the one who's ordained us to be peculiar. So our quality of peculiarity gives him glory. It 
it's amazing that there's so much conversation about culture, and sometimes people describe and discuss culture as if it is some um, disembodied phenomenon. The culture has become. The culture has become. Well, what is culture? Culture, our English word culture derives from the, the root word cultus in Latin. Simply put, culture is comprised of the ideals, beliefs, preferences, pursuits, and practices of the people who populate a particular region. Simply put, people create culture. American culture is determined by what we Americans think, by what we want, by what we do. That is what creates culture. The presence of the people of God in any particular region should ultimately have an impact and influence that culture. The degree to which that influence takes place is left to the sovereignty of God. But when we are proclaiming the gospel and, and appealing to people's hearts and minds, it will invariably have an impact. And this is where I want to get a bit more specific. So we've talked about the what, salt and light. The why, for the glory of the king. Where? Where? Go ye therefore into the world. It's the king of kings' desire that his ambassadors carry his gospel and make disciples in his name all over the world. I've explained before that the Lord has this. There's a principle in scripture that the Lord begins a work and leaves room for his offspring to fulfill it in the very beginning. Yahweh had the capacity to make the earth filled with 10 billion people with the snap of his fingers. Yet he divinely and intentionally began with Adam and from his rib formed Eve and invited him to join him in filling the earth by yielding to his instructions. Similarly, Jesus always intended for the gospel of the kingdom of God to be proclaimed in the entirety of the world. Yet he limits his physical incarnate ministry to the geographical boundaries of Israel. Why? leaves room for his offspring, beginning with his apostles, to execute his commission. That is his principle. And not only that, <laughs> he instructs them. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, let me turn there. Well, verses 1 through 8, I'm going to turn there briefly. In Acts chapter 1, let me get my pages to work with me. This is the resurrected Christ in the process of providing many convincing proofs after his resurrection. He says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power. The Greek word for power there is dunamis, from which we get our English word dynamite. You will receive dunamis power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Jesus told his apostles, you will be endued with dunamis, dunamis power, by Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses. I've explained before, the Greek term for witness there is martis, from which we get our English word martyrdom from. Most often we think about a martyr being someone who loses their natural lives in furtherance of a cause. I understand that explanation, but martyrdom biblically is becoming the living dead. You will be endued with power, dunamis power, to be my witnesses, becoming the living dead, dead to your own objectives, own prerogatives, own agendas, and alive to the agendas of Christ, to the agenda of Messiah. Being witnesses is a state of being, not merely an activity. That's why he said you will be my witnesses. Being a witness is a state of being. That's why we are called to be witnesses when we're on stage in front of people, when there's lights, camera, action, and we're called to be witnesses when there's no one around. And it's just us, our computer screens, and the Holy Spirit because he's always there. We're called to be his witnesses. Being witnesses includes various activities like evangelism. The Greek word there is euangelion, the proclamation of the availability of the free gift of salvation as a result of Messiah's atoning sacrifice. 
as a witness, we do other things to obey our king. But the doing should flow from being, from the state of being as a witness. And you'll notice when Jesus explained that you will be endued with power, you'll be filled with power by the spirit. It's not merely a filling for consumption. Ooh, ooh, they sure feel good. They feel good. No, it's a filling for function. The Lord has given us his spirit for functionality. You will be endued with power for the purpose, for the function of being his witnesses. Then you, we cross-reference this command to be, or should I say this description of what we would be as witnesses, with the command in Matthew 28. And then we'll go back to Acts 17. I know this is a lot of scripture, but this is very, very important. Because the same Messiah <laughs> in resurrection, post his resurrection, gathers his apostles again. Well, Matthew's recording this. In the Matthew 28, he says, simply put, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's a great commission. Jesus says, all authority is mine. Therefore, you go. Whose authority upon which do we go to execute this commission? It's his authority. It's not ours. We go because he said so. We go expecting effective witnessing because he said so. Because it's his authority that we go in. Then he explains what we do. Making disciples of all nations. The Greek word there is ethnos. Of all people groups. <laughs> Ain't nobody safe. Everybody can get it. <laughs> Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The touchstone of disciple making is obedience. Teaching the disciple to be obedient as the discipler is striving to be obedient in all manner. Christ following is a comprehensive faith. Every aspect of our lives should be subjected to the Lordship of Christ. Then you have those principles, those commands from Acts 1, from Matthew 28, from Matthew 5. And then we realize, oh, snap, God has given us a context. Acts chapter 17, we talk about this a lot. Acts chapter 17. I want to spend, I'm spending this time intentionally, and I'm, I'm bringing this to a particular point. Because we have the what, salt and light duty. We have the why. For the Lord's glory. We have the where. World impact. World impact. A subset of the where. And the wind. Not wind. W-I-N-D. But wind. Why did I add a D to that word? <laughs> subset to the where. Is what I'm about to share with you. And then we move over to the when. Both. Addressed in Acts chapter 17. During Paul's discourse with the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers. In the Areopagus, we've talked about this before. Come right over to verse 26. And he made from one blood every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us. <laughs> A subset of the where, world impact, but each disciple has been given a context in which we are to execute the what with the why and the where. He made from mankind one blood. I'm sorry, he made from one blood every nation of mankind. Same term, ethnos. So where did the nations come from? One man. <laughs> He has determined before time the boundaries of their dwelling place. Brothers and sisters, the where and the when are context questions. God has given each disciple a context in which we are to execute his commission. 
Remember, the execution of his commission includes the salt and light duty, preserving the integrity of the gospel, advancing the integrity of the gospel, not having a light, keeping it to ourselves, but putting it on a lampstand so that as many people as possible are able to benefit from the elevation of the light, benefit from its illumination and its warmth. The fact that you are a citizen in this nation, you've been born in the United States of America, is a feature of God's divine design for you. It is the context that God has given for you, just as he's done for me, for us to be his ambassadors. God could have made us Christians in any other country in the world. But he determined by divine design to make us Americans. And his desire is for us as Americans to put the lamp on the lampstand. Now, some of you may know. Our friend personally and our friend of this program, Dr. George Barna, has released his latest study showing that there are hundred, over 100 million people who profess to be of some sort of faith who are not planning to vote in this election. 32 million of them are evangelical Christians who profess frequent church attendance or describe themselves, themselves as evangelical Christians who have frequent church attendance. I just want to tell you simply, and I would never try to intrude on anybody's consciences or try to demean Christ following to a workspace phenomenon to where justification is a product of works. But I will tell you, when God has placed you in a particular context and he's redeemed you by the blood of the lamb, made you a part of his family, and tasked you with salt and light duty, he knows the context that he's placed you in. He's placed us in 21st century American context just as he placed the Apostle Paul in the 1st century Roman context. And the Lord expects no less of us as 21st century Americans than he expected of the Apostle Paul in terms of using everything at our disposal within our context to put the light on a lampstand. If you've been listening to this program any length of time, you know better than anybody, I would never tell you that the Lord will deliver his people through politics. Never will you hear me say that. What I will tell you, however, is that God in his sovereignty has afforded you and I this particular American context in which to be his ambassadors. We've talked before, and I would talk about it now. The Apostle Paul used everything at his disposal, including his Roman citizenship, to put the light on the lampstand. We've explained before how the Apostle Paul, knowing his adjudication rights and the, the laws of appellate courts in the Roman Empire, being persecuted and prosecuted on trumped up charges, initially goes to Jerusalem, appeals according to the law from Jerusalem, goes next to Caesarea Philippi, exhausting his appellate rights, he ultimately appeals to Caesar in Rome that caused even the lower level judiciary to wonder. And if this guy had not attempted to exhaust his appeals, we could have set him free. More when we come back. What do we mean America is a Christian nation? Our founders recognized that our rights come from God our creator, not our government. And the sole purpose of government is to preserve and protect those rights. Why America is a Christian nation with Jenna Ellis. Our government is founded on Judeo-Christian values. Learn more and share the news with the DVD at resources.afa.net. That's resources.afa.net. Sometimes I'm not a very good Christian and the Lord still seems to love me and do good things for me. Grace is an outside force that works good in my life rather than good pouring forth from what I do. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. In my own spiritual life, I'd much rather ask a loving savior to take control. I'm Ed Vitagliano and you can read the rest of For the Grace of God Has Appeared at thestand.net. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and one-minute commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. 
Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. We're in the last segment already. I'm just going to continue on with the thought I was sharing before we went to the break. The Apostle Paul, knowing his appellate rights, exhausted his appellate rights. Not because he was seeking to have the fairest trial, criminal trial. (laughs) But because he recognized that he was an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. He even described himself in some places as an an ambassador in chains. (laughs) That he recognized his chains, his incarceration was a station from which he was to continue executing the Great Commission. And so by Paul exhausting his appellate rights within the Roman first century context, he's able to conclude his epistle to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verse 21, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. <laughs> Without Paul exhausting his Roman citizenship rights, he never would have had access to Caesar's household and to proclaim the gospel even into Caesar's household. Utilizing that was a tool. It wasn't the end-all, be-all. It was a tool that God created. And the context that God had placed the Apostle Paul in, from which, the context within which he was to obey God, the commands of the Lord. We have particular accesses, rights, abilities in our nation and the context that we have to advance the king's agenda. Romans 13 lays out very succinctly government's purpose. Restrain wickedness by punishing the evildoer, rewarding the righteous, One of the distinctions from a first century Roman context where there's a Caesar in America, we the people. At least that's how it was set up. But much of what has transpired has been the product of many of the American citizens forfeiting what is available to us, including many professing Christ followers, and abdicating the functions of what God ordained to be his minister to to punish wickedness and say, oh, that's messy business. Listen, man, Christ following is messy business. Making disciples is messy business. God is the one who ordains our context. Can you imagine Daniel saying, oh, no, Lord, I don't want to participate in obeying what you've commanded me through all of the prophets, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, all the prophets, you know, because Babylon is messy business. Yeah, it's messy business. The world is messy business because of the sin for fallenness of man. But God has ordained his body to be salt and light. If all of the Christ followers absent ourselves from civic participation, guess what we are going to have? (laughs) And I want us to see that Christ following isn't mutually exclusive from civic engagement. Man, you rewind the tape. It was Christ followers, civic engagement that gave rise (laughs) to this constitutional republic with democratic features. Not everyone who participated was a Christ follower, but a large percentage of them were. And even those who were not Christ followers, they were influenced by the worldview of the Christ followers. Not to compel each man by law with brute force to convert or die, as the Islamists argue, but to create an environment that would allow each man to be drawn to the King of Kings by his spirit through the faithful obedience of the Christ follower who is on salt and light duty. Do we see that? Do we see that? There's some that say, oh, politics has gotten so messy. It is messy, no doubt about it. That's what happens when we cede this territory to the wicked. In many ways, candidates that are available are a reflection of what's present in our nation. In many ways, the story of America's secularization is the absence and the negligence of the believer over time, over generations. The what? Salt and light duty. (laughs) The why? For the Lord's glory. Where? Where has he planted you? 
we have accesses and opportunities and abilities to us that our brethren in other nations don't have. And it's very easy. I've been talking about this for a little bit now for us to be manipulated by our context into a passive environmental seduction that provokes a lethargy and a laziness and a disengagement. The other aspect of it is the wind. The wind. I keep putting the D on this word. A wind. The wind. Back to Acts 17. He has determined before time allotted periods, the times in which we would live. Guys, the time that we are alive is the time that God has assigned to us. He could have made us believers. You know, with this glorious melanin that I have, if the Lord would have deposited me in the United States of America in, oh, I don't know, 1825, I wouldn't have had the opportunities that I have now. But with the opportunities I have now, God requires of me to put the light on the lampstand. We have the opportunity through civic participation, and make no mistake about it, civic participation is not salvific. But we have the opportunity through civic participation to keep the highways and byways open so that the gospel can be proclaimed. Yes, I see the mounting forces, the desires of the AOCs of the world, you know, to, you know, stamp out disinformation and, and you know, lurch John Kerry. Oh, we have this First Amendment that doesn't allow us. Lamenting the fact that we have a First Amendment. But we have the wherewithal that if the First Amendment is going to be legitimately changed, we have a say. We have a say. But so many are being duped and, and being manipulated away from obedience in the context that God has planted us in, the context that God has planted us in, and we're neglecting an aspect that God has ordained for us to utilize so that we can put the light on a lampstand. To say it differently, we should take advantage of every opportunity and use everything at our disposal to proclaim the gospel and make way for the gospel to be proclaimed. We need to take advantage of every opportunity and utilize everything at our disposal to make disciples and make sure the roadways are cleared, proverbially, to allow disciple-making to continue. For too long, we have not utilized the liberties that we've had for God-glorifying purposes, by and large. I'm not talking about individuals. There are certainly exceptions. But we, we should not allow other people's sinfulness to provoke sinfulness in us. Neglect in us. You want to talk about loving your neighbor. One of the most loving things you can do for your neighbor is to keep an environment that is free for the gospel to be proclaimed. And I want to be clear. Even if the tides of liberty turn against that free proclamation, we will still have a duty. We still have a responsibility. Like Peter and John, you decide whether it's better for us to obey you, obey men, or obey God. But while we have a say, why not say? Why not say? I understand uh, in this particular election that there are all kinds of concerns. And again, I respect people's concerns. But shouldn't we still try as much as possible to do the maximum good that we can? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we try as best as possible as far as it pertains to you and me that we invest ourselves in such a way where we preserve the liberty to proclaim the truth? I was talking earlier, you know, me standing here saying what marriage is as God defines it in Scripture. Don't you realize our neighbor to the north cannot do that? that believers in Canada cannot get on a microphone and speak openly about God's design for marriage. If they do so, they face government prosecution. That's just a fact. Now, should we, in an effort to maintain our integrity, allow our ability to proclaim the truth over the airwaves freely to be ripped away from us? And don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Even if the, the, those, that freedom is ripped away from us, we still have a duty to be faithful, but why should we allow it to be ripped away is what I'm saying. 
Should we not do as much good as possible? As much as possible? Can you imagine, you know, those people, both less melanated and more melanated on the Underground Railroad because they weren't able in one moment to abolish all of slavery, that they were refused to help at least one slave escape? Can you imagine that? That's foolish talk. That's foolish talk. Should we? Because states, some states, they're voting to kill babies. Should we not try to save every baby that we can? It's foolish talk. And, and listen, and I don't, I don't mean to be condemning, and I don't mean to be condescending to anybody, but I feel like there is this, there is this seduction that, that has occurred that has blunted the believers the capacity to discern where we are in the times that we're in now. My faith is squarely placed in Jesus Christ and him alone. My confidence is not in any man in any particular candidate, but I also recognize one candidate at the top of the ticket will take us in one direction, and the other candidate will take us in another direction where we at least have a little bit more time to execute salt and light duty. I understand that. And here's another thing. The top of the ticket is not the only thing on the ballot. By God's grace, the Lord moved our founders to give us a separation of powers to where whatever goes on at the executive branch, we have the wherewithal to be a, a check and a balance on it through the legislative branch. Do you realize the Senate hangs in the balance? Do you realize the House of Representatives hangs in the balance? That's at the federal level. Then beyond that, what is going on in your, in your states? What is going on in your local communities? What is going on in your local school boards? I'm a homeschool dad, but I don't want my neighbor being indoctrinated with sexually rebellious and, and, and transgenderism and lesbianism and homosexuality. I don't want my neighbor's children indoctrinated with that. That's not loving my neighbor just to go, well, well, my kids, I'm, I'm at home, and so I don't care what happens with my neighbor's children. That's not loving my neighbor. What I'm saying very simply is that God has given us a context to execute his commission. And God is sovereign over the context he's placed us in. We shouldn't say, well, because the Christian, the Chinese Christians don't have the wherewithal to participate in whether or not they will have the freedom to proclaim the gospel. So that means we shouldn't. <laughs> no, brothers and sisters, that's not the Lord's desire. That's not the Lord's desire. We need to recognize that the Great Commission and the responsibility to execute it the context that we have has been given to us, has been assigned to us by God. What are we going to do with that assignment? It truly hurt my heart to see that there, there were so many millions of professing Christians who were willing to even to speak to a pollster and to, to declare proudly almost that I'm not going to participate civically. Again, I would never try to intrude on anybody's consciences, but I would encourage you to re revisit the scripture. God is sovereign over your context, not you. You didn't decide you wanted to be born when you were born. You didn't decide you wanted to be alive in the 21st century. And even if you happen to be a legal immigrant to this country, that you didn't just get here on your own, in your own strength. God's divine providence allowed for you to be here. I ain't talking to illegals because y'all ain't supposed to be voting anyway. If you're an illegal alien. <laughs> just, just something as, as, as simple as that. Like you had Congress members straight party line vote. A certain party refuses to pass legislation that says, you know what, illegal aliens can't participate in federal elections. What's the harm in that? Unless. <laughs> Unless. And be, let me be clear. There's no politician and no election that's going to save us individually. But the Lord does move through governmental processes to give his people time to do what he requires of us. And who knows what will happen with your obedience? The Ninevites had the wherewithal to recognize they needed to repent. Well, we have the capacity, will we recognize the necessity of repentance in our nation? I just want us to understand we need to think biblically about it. Welcome the Lord to lead us in this. And I pray by God's grace that his people will show up 
we show up like Nehemiah with a sword and our building, building tools. Because our faith is in not an elected official, but in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But he's also the one who's planted us and assigned us to the context that he's given us to be on salt and light duty. <laughs>